I grew up in a small town in central Arkansas. Every deer season around November, my family and I would go to our hunting cabin near Mena, Arkansas. My great grandpa built the cabin in 1984. It was a nice cabin for the time. It's slightly outdated now, but it worked fine for my family and friends and I. Two years ago, my friends Austin and Cody went with me to the cabin in late October for a preseason hunt called muzzleload hunting. We were scouting an area about a mile from the cabin looking for any signs of deer because we were considering putting a stand near the spot. After splitting up and wandering around trying to find an area with the best lines of sight for a stand, I came across a pile of rocks in the woods. After closer inspection, I realized it was a grave belonging to a man named Ed Crane. We were not bothered, more interested than anything. We snapped a couple pics, and after finding a decent spot for a stand, we headed back to the cabin. Cody tried doing some research to find anything out about Ed Crane, but he didn't come up with a whole lot. Fast forward three weeks, we're back at the cabin for the official modern gun season. This time it's just Austin and I. We were sitting in the cabin discussing where we should go for opening day, and I decided I would try out the stand we had previously put up during muzzle loading season. Austin went about a mile and a half the other direction towards a small lake off the property to hunt. I left the cabin around 4.45 a.m. because I had about a mile and a half walk and wanted plenty of time to walk slow and get to the stand before daylight. This isn't a national forest and you cannot drive any vehicles into the hunting trails. We split up at the end of the road, me going left towards the stand and Austin going the opposite direction. It was a normal walk for the most part. I've been in these woods since I was nine years old and a mile walk was nothing out of the ordinary. I finished my walk and approached the stand, trying to be quiet as to not scare any deer that are bedding in the area. As the sun slowly started to rise, I couldn't help but keep looking over to my right to see the grave we had previously found. It was around 30 yards from where I was sitting, and it was thinly buried in surrounding brush. There was just enough light to make out the mound of rocks through the leaves. I saw something move out of the left side corner of my vision. This was not frightening at all, I'm completely used to seeing movement early in the morning while hunting. If anything, this was exciting. I turned fully to the left, but I could not locate what I was looking at. There was no movement. About that time, I heard, hey, in an almost whisper scream coming from behind me. This made me physically jump so hard that I shook the stand. I flung my head around backwards, but there was nothing there that I could make out. After turning on my headlamp and panning my surrounding area for at least five to six minutes, I took out my hand radio. While shaking, I radioed to Austin asking if he was near me. I got no response. I continued calling in on the radio while looking back and forth for the next 20 minutes. Daylight was approaching, and after chalking it up to being in my head, I finally started to calm down. The sun rose up over the trees, burning off the thin layer of fog that was covering the woods. This is around 7 a.m. now. I had almost forgotten about the incident when I heard it again. This time, hey Caleb. It was in the same whisper type scream as before. This time it was enough. I grabbed my bag and gun so fast. I accidentally left the hand radio on the seat beside me in the stand. I climbed down the ladder so fast I almost slipped off. I hit the ground and speed walked all the way back to the cabin, peering over my back every 10 to 20 steps. I opened the cabin door, and Austin was nowhere to be seen. He was still hunting. When Austin finally did return to the cabin, he was confused. He kept asking if that was me screaming into the radio. I explained to him my experience, and I explained I never screamed. His radio was clipped to his belt while he was standing in the doorway trying to make sense of what had happened, and right as we were talking about it, his radio started making this incoherent screeching sound. Not a static sound. It sounded organic, like some kind of animal was making it. We listened intently and sat the radio right beside us for the rest of the day. It never happened again. We came back later that week with our other friend Cody, and I looked for my radio in the stand and on the ground around it. It was nowhere to be found. Needless to say, we no longer hunt in that spot. We don't even hunt anywhere in that direction past the gate. It was the weirdest, most unexplainable experience of my life. It was a cold December night. I was hanging out with a few friends, Todd and Tristan. We were bored and had nothing to do. So one of us came up with the idea of going to the nearby train station platform to take some pictures and goof off. 
The platform isn't far from our houses. When we got there, we started taking pictures of the liminal space we found ourselves in. After hanging out there for a little while, it started getting even colder and we were hungry. So we started to head to our car. The path back takes us on a long footbridge across a canal. We spent some time on the bridge joking around and taking more pictures. The mood could not have been better, but the cold was getting to us, so we started back on our way again. The bridge was not wide enough for the three of us to walk side to side. I was walking in front, Todd and Tristan behind me. We were joking and chatting as we walked. Tristan said something funny, and I turned, still walking and laughing at what he said, when I noticed a man walking just feet behind Tristan. He looked to be in his late thirties. His face was dirty and he was wearing a black and white plaid shirt and ball cap. His arms were down at his sides. In one hand was a cigarette, and in the other was a large kitchen knife, clear as day. My blood ran cold when I saw it. I quickly spun back around, pretending I hadn't seen him. For some reason, I thought that was the best thing to do. My fight or flight kicked in, and I found myself speed walking to the end of the bridge. I hoped that my friends would catch on and match my pace. I glanced back at them to check, and thankfully they were right on my tail. But the man was too. He was now so close that an outsider would have thought he was part of our group. He stepped off the bridge and took a path going to the right, my friends still having no idea the man was even back there. Fearing I was about to need to defend myself, I held my tripod up like an axe. The man seemed to get the memo and took the path to the left. We walked a little bit further before I pointed him out to Todd and I gave him a quick rundown of the situation we almost found ourselves in. Walking backwards, we watched the man disappear into the darkness and we hurried back to the car. We drove to the nearest gas station where we got food and talked it over. The whole situation was just a weird story up until a few days ago when I was checking the pictures I had taken that night. This picture shows Todd under a light on the station platform, but just beyond the light, almost behind a freight car, is the silhouette of the man. The picture was taken at least 30 minutes before the situation on the bridge, meaning he was watching us waiting for us to put the cameras down and turn our backs. You hear stories of things like this happening, but you never expect it to happen to you. I still get chills thinking about how differently it could have gone. My husband was in the military and after we got married, we bought a house in a small town in North Carolina. Despite being considered a military town, it really was not a safe area to be in. One night we even heard gunshots down the street from us. But anyway, because of his job, he was gone for training operations often, and he also worked nights when he wasn't having to travel. This meant I was home alone most of the time. At the time of this story, I was in college full time, so I was able to fill my days with lots of studying and homework to pass the time he wasn't home. One night when I was writing an essay, I was laying in bed with our dog Simba, and we both heard what sounded like rustling coming from above our heads. Simba started barking and growling, which is unusual for him. He's a pit bull mix, and despite people thinking they're scary dogs, he is a huge baby and had never acted like this before. I thought it was mice, so I texted my husband and he agreed. He told me he'd call pest control the following day so I wouldn't have to worry about laying bait and traps myself. Two days later, pest control came and did what I thought was a thorough inspection of the house. There was some evidence of mice and roaches in the attic, so he laid some baits and also sealed some entry points in our home. However, over the next week, the rustling kept getting worse and worse and was always at nighttime. And every time I would hear it, Simba would freak out and at one point his hair was literally standing up on his back. This started to really freak me out, so when I called my husband after this happened, he assured me that it was the mice and they were just freaking Simba out. Later that night, just as I was about to fall asleep, I thought I heard footsteps from above. But since my dog didn't hear it, I thought I was just psyching myself out. Being home alone so often, I did have some anxiety, especially at nighttime, because I didn't feel safe without my husband home. The next day, I slept in pretty late and had woken up with a fever, so I wasn't feeling great. I got up to let Simba outside. The layout of the house was odd. You had to go into the garage to open the backyard door, and the entrance to the attic was right above it. As I was walking to the door, I felt like I was going to vomit, not because I was sick, but because the door had a huge dirty handprint on it and a bunch of smudges from the inside. Someone had been in there. 
I assumed someone had broken in through the garage in the middle of the night, so I took a picture of the door and called the police. I texted my husband to tell him what was going on while I waited for the police, but unfortunately he couldn't respond until later due to work. The police came in just a few minutes since their station was right down the street. I showed them the handprints and how I couldn't understand how someone broke in because I would have heard the garage door opening. Then I realized that maybe the rustling I was hearing wasn't mice and that the footstep I heard was actually a person. I told this to the police and they immediately checked the attic. It turned out some guy who lived with his family down the street from us was a meth addict and he had been avoiding staying at his family's house and so he had snuck into our garage when I was gone one day and had been living up there for a little over a week. Somehow pest control had missed him because he was hiding behind a bunch of boxes. Apparently the inspector was not as thorough as I had hoped. Our ring security system never even picked the guy up on camera entering our home, so he must have entered another way. Thankfully we no longer live in that house or area and despite this happening a few years ago, I still get scared being home alone at night for any amount of time. I'm just thankful nobody got hurt. The year was 2006. I had moved into a house with my college friend Stephen and his friend Heather. I worked overnight at a radio station a few times a week. To keep my body regulated, I kept the same schedule on my nights off, which means I was up all night with way too much time on my hands. Something I liked to do super late or past midnight was to stroll through a graveyard near my house. I usually brought a camera and a tape recorder to see if I could catch anything strange. I did this a few times and did capture a few photos that showed activity, including a strange mass of color near a bench. One night driving back home, I listened to the playback of the cassette tape in my car of what I had just recorded. On the tape, I had asked if there was anyone here with us, even though I was the only one there. A weird, exhausted voice replied with a simple, no, as if to say we were the only ones there. When I heard this, I had just about driven off the road. I had chills and became terrified. I know this was the point of what I was trying to do, but I guess I didn't know how to react if I had actually caught something. When I came home, I woke up my roommate to seek some comfort. He was less than empathetic and told me not to bring that crap in the house. Shortly after this incident, things got weird. One night in my room, I was watching videos on my computer when the decorative leaves I had on the wall started swinging back and forth as if they had just been smacked by something. Another night, I had come home after purchasing some things at the store. I was in my room, and I had left the plastic bag from the store on the floor. As I was lying in bed, the bag started making a crackling sound like crumpling a bag with your hands. I looked at the bag. It was just sitting there. It kept making the sound and soon enough started moving and hopping across the floor all by itself. I jumped up, stood on my bed, and called my roommate on the phone who was upstairs. I told them to come downstairs to my room ASAP. As soon as I got off the phone, the bag immediately stopped moving and making noises. My roommate thought I was crazy when I told him what happened. He took the bag outside and checked for what he thought might have been a mouse or something in the bag, but no such thing was found. I also had one of my worst recurring nightmares in that room. I've had a recurring nightmare since I was a kid, where I feel like my eyes are being forced shut into sleep. It happens after I wake up or before I fall asleep. My teeth always start chattering and I can barely make any audible speech to tell it to go away. I have never known what this was. The times this has happened to me, a few unpleasant things have come along with it. One time I felt hand grabbing at me. Another time I saw a horrifying face in the closet. One night in the room, I began drifting off into sleep early, and in between being awake and being asleep, this thing started up again. It was very weak at first, and I taunted it, saying, is that the best you can do? But it became powerful and hard to fight. It felt like 30 full seconds of not being able to get out of this powerful force. I couldn't move, and I felt like my body was being spun around, even though it wasn't. Finally, it stopped. I don't know if this is some sort of sleep paralysis, or if what was happening in the room had anything to do with it. Early one morning at 5 a.m., what sounded like huge footsteps walking through somewhere in our place shook the whole house. Everyone was asleep except for me, of course lying in bed. It couldn't have been Steven upstairs, he was never this loud. We lived near a military base, so maybe it was from that, but the way the loud booming stomps moved in succession was like some giant person walking through. All these things were confusing and mysterious 
but it wasn't until one night when I snapped a picture of the three of us in the living room that my roommate and I knew that we had a presence in the house. We were having a party. What you're looking at is me taking a picture of us in the living room with our giant mirror on the wall. I was holding my camera as still as I could, yet there seems to be activity all around us. I have no idea what those weird strings of lights are to the right of the lamp. We have nothing that would give off any kind of light like that in the house. To the right of that, there seems to be a strange mass of light imitating a figure, but the weirdest of all is the rising mass of yellow light coming between Steven and I which looks to have eyes, a face, and a sinister smile atop a body. Maybe that yellow is a reflection from our kitchen light, but there's a lot of it. I've also tried retaking the same picture, and those yellow lights don't come up anymore. I don't know if something from the cemetery had followed me home or if there was already a presence before we moved in, but what I told you was the worst of it. And about 10 months later, we moved out of that house not telling any future tenant or renter about it. A friend of mine, who I'll call John, was 27 at the time, and his former buddy, who I'll call Rich, was around the same age. Rich was a very daring man, if you will. John at the time was struggling with life decisions and had very little friends. Rich and John belonged to a hobby group of people who are interested in fire alarms, exit signs, and other life safety equipment. Kind of an unusual hobby, but they're out there. Rich had a problem with going into abandoned buildings and stealing these devices and often bringing them home, adding them to his collection or otherwise selling them on eBay. While John didn't think it was right, he was desperate for a friend and went along with him on his adventure. But this adventure very well became a nightmare for John. On November 18th, 2019, they settled off for a trip to Gary, Indiana. And if you don't know Gary, it's not the safest place on the planet, to say the least. The trip would entail staying at a hotel in the nearby town of Hammond and heading into several abandoned schools so Rich could basically steal old and oftentimes rare life safety equipment. It was going well for them until November 20th. This day at approximately 7 at night, John and Rich went to the abandoned Horace S. Norton Elementary School at 1356 Harrison Boulevard. They started making their way through the first floor. The doors were wide open, and I mean wide open. The building smelled like sewage, skunk, and shit all mixed together. They made their way to the north end wing of the building. John watched Rich rip down several old exit signs. Again, John and I are against that, but John was desperate for a friend. As they made their way down to the south side of the building, they entered the cafeteria. It was pitch black except for the beam of their flashlights. And there was some graffiti, desks, and books scattered. You know, the typical abandoned building scenes. John was taking pictures throughout. After the cafeteria, they made their way to the gym. Little did John know his life was about to change forever. John noticed a trail of blood with his flashlight and out of curiosity decided to follow it and what it led to was quite disturbing. A 27-year-old female laid there dead in a pool of blood. It was gruesome as hell. Her arms were up with her hands in the shape of a dinosaur as John put it. Just the way John described the scene to me made me lose sleep for a couple nights. John screamed and ran into Rich and Rich whispered, shh, they may hear us. John was shaken up and showed Rich the body to which he said, just don't say anything to anybody and we'll pretend this never happened. They left immediately, but obviously shaking. As soon as they got back to the hotel, John called the police. Sure enough, the woman had been missing for two days prior. It didn't take long for the police to track down a text conversation between the woman who was now identified as 27-year-old Adriana Saucedo and her murderer. She was planning to buy some weed and an iPhone apparently, and the suspects had intended to rob her. The robbery went wrong and they ended up killing her, not before dragging her body into the gym of the elementary school and casually dumping it there just a day before John and Rich went there. Sure enough, it didn't take long for the police to track down the teen murderer and put him in custody. The teen also turned in two others as well. All of these kids were charged as adults, and the story is on the news as well. John is no longer friends with Rich, for obvious reasons, and this event still haunts John and I to this day.